Okay, chapter 3, Tahiti. Remarkable occurrences, etc. at George's Island. At Tahiti. Note, the way of reckoning the day in sea journals is from noon to noon. But as the most material transaction at this island must happen in the daytime, this method will be attended with ill conveniences in inserting the transactions of each day. For this reason, I shall, during our stay at this island, but no longer, reckon the day according to the civil account, that is, to begin and end at midnight. We had no sooner come to an anchor in Royal Bay, as before mentioned, than a great number of the natives in their canoes came off to the ship and brought with them coconuts, etc., these they seemed to set a great value upon. Amongst those that came off to the ship was an elderly man whose name was Oha, him the gentleman that had been here before in the Dolphin, Lieutenant Gore and Mr. Molyneux, the master, knew and had often spoke of as one that had been of service to them. This man, together with some others, I took on board and made much of, thinking that he might on some occasions be of use to us. As our stay at this place was not likely to be very short, I thought it was very necessary that some order should be observed in trafficking with the natives, such that merchandise as we had on board for that purpose might continue to bear a proper value and not leave it to everyone's own particular fancy, which could not fail to bring on confusion and quarrels between us and the natives, and would infallibly lessen the value of such articles as we had to traffic with. In order to, pre to prevent this, the following rules were ordered to be observed, viz. Rules to be observed by every person in or belonging to His Majesty's bark, the endeavor, for the better establishing a regular and uniform trade for provisions, etc., with the inhabitants of George's Island. 1. To endeavor by every fair means to cultivate a friendship with the natives and to treat them with all imaginable humanity. 2. A proper person or persons will be appointed to trade with the natives for all manner of provisions, fruits, and other productions of the earth, and no officer or seaman or other person belonging to the ship, excepting such as are so appointed, shall trade or offer to trade for any sort of provisions, fruit, or other productions of the earth, unless they have my leave to do so. 3. Every person employed on shore, on any duty whatsoever, is strictly to attend to the same, and if by neglect he loseth any of his arms or working tools or suffers them to be stole, the full value thereof will be charged against his pay, according to the custom of the Navy in such cases, and he shall receive such further punishment as the nature of the offense may deserve. 4. The same penalty will be inflicted upon every person who is found to embezzle trade or offer to trade with any of the ship's stores of what nature soever. 5. No sort of iron or anything that is made of iron or any sort of cloth or any other useful or necessary articles are to be given in exchange for anything but provisions. J.C. As soon as the ship was properly secured, I went on shore, accompanied by Mr. Banks and the other gentlemen. With a party of men under arms, we took along with us Oha, who took us to the place where the dolphin watered, and made signs to us, as well as we could understand, that we might occupy that ground. But it happened not to be fit for our purpose. No one of the natives made the least opposition at our landing, but came to us with all imaginable marks of friendship and submission. We afterwards made a circuit through the woods and then came on board. We did not find the inhabitants to be numerous, and we imagined that several of them had fled from their habitations upon our arrival in the bay. Friday, 14th. This morning we had a great many canoes about the ship, though most of them came from the westward, and brought nothing with them but a few coconuts, etc. Two that appeared to be chiefs were had on board, together with several others, for it was a hard manner to keep them out of the ship, as they climb like monkeys, but it was still harder to keep them from stealing, but everything that came within their reach. In this they are prodigious expert. I made each of these two chiefs a present of a hatchet, things that they seemed mostly to value. As soon as we had partly got clear of these people, I took two boats and went to the westward, all the gentlemen being along with me. My design was to see if there was not a more commodious harbor, and to try the disposition of the natives, having along with us the two chiefs above mentioned. The first place we landed at was in Great Canoe Harbor, so called by Captain Wallace. 
Here the natives flocked about us in great numbers, and in as friendly a manner as we could wish, only that they showed a great inclination to pick our pockets. We were conducted to a chief, who for distinction's sake we called Hercules. After staying a short time with him, and distributing a few presents about us, we proceeded farther, and came to a chief who I shall call Lycurgus. This man entertained us with broiled fish, coconuts, etc., with great hospitality, and all the time took great care to tell us to take care of our pockets, as a great number of people had crowded about us. Notwithstanding the care we took, Dr. Solander and Mr. Monkhouse had each of them their pockets picked, the one of his spyglass and the other of his snuff-box. As soon as Lycurgus was made acquainted with the theft, he dispersed the people in a moment, and the method he made use of was to lay hold on the first thing that came in his way and throw it at them, and happy was he or she that could get first out of his way. He seemed very much concerned for what had happened, and by a way of recompense offered us everything that was in his house, but we refused to accept of anything and made signs to him that we only wanted the things again. He had already sent people out after them, and it was not long before they were returned. We found the natives very numerous wherever we came, and from what we could judge seemed very peaceably inclined. About six o'clock in the evening, we returned on board, very well satisfied with our little excursion. Saturday, 15th. Winds at east during the day, in the night a light breeze off the land. And as I apprehend it, be usual here for the trade wind to blow during a great part of the day from the eastern board, and to have it calm or light breezes from the land that is southerly during the night with fair weather. I shall only mention the wind and weather when they deviate from this rule. The morning, several of the chiefs, this morning, several of the chiefs we had seen yesterday came on board and brought with them hogs, breadfruit, etc. And for these, we gave them hatchets, linen, and such things as they valued. Having not met with yesterday a more convenient situation for every purpose we wanted than the place we are now, I therefore, without delay, resolved to pitch upon some spot upon the northeast point of the bay, properly situated for observing the transit of Venus, and at the same time under the command of our ship's guns, and there to throw up a small fort for our defense. Accordingly, I went ashore with a party of men accompanied by Mr. Banks, Mr. Sullender, and Mr. Green. We took along with us one of Mr. Banks' tents, and after we had fixed upon a place for our purpose, we set up the tent and marked out the ground we intended to occupy. By this time, a number of the natives had got collected together about us, seemingly only to look on, as not one of them had any weapon, either offensive or defensive. I would suffer none to come within the lines I had marked out, excepting one who appeared to be a chief in old Oha. To these two men, we endeavored to explain as well as we could that we wanted that ground to sleep upon such a number of nights, and then we would go away. Whether they understood us or no is uncertain, but no one appeared the least displeased at what it was about. Indeed, the ground we had fixed upon was of no use to them, being part of the sandy beach upon the shore of the bay, and not near to any of their habitations. It being too late in the day to do anything more, a party with a petty officer was left to guard the tent, while we, with another party, took a walk into the woods, and with us, most of the natives. We had but just crossed the river when Mr. Banks shot three ducks at one shot, which surprised them so much that most of them fell down as though they had been shot likewise. I was in hopes this would have had some good effect, but the event did not prove it, for we had not been long from the tent before the natives again began to gather about and one of them, more daring than the rest, pushed one of the sentinels down, snatched the musket out of his hand, and made a push at him, and then made off, and with him all the rest. Immediately upon this, the officer ordered the party to fire, and the man who took the musket was shot dead before he had got far from the tent. But the musket was carried quite off when this happened. I and Mr. Banks with the other party was about half a mile off, returning out of the woods upon hearing the firing of muskets, and the natives leaving us at the same time. We suspected that something was the matter, and hastened our march, but before we arrived the hole was over, and every one of the natives fled except old Oha, who stuck by us the whole time, and I believe from the first he either knew or had some suspicion that the people would attempt something at the tent, as he was very much against our going into the woods out of sight of the tent. However, 
He might have other reasons for Mr. Hicks being ashore the day before. The natives would not per permit him to go into the woods. This made me resolve to go and see whether they meant to, put, to prescribe bounds to us or no. Old Oha, as I have said before, was the only one of the natives that stayed by us, and by his means we prevailed on about twenty of them to come to the tent, and there sit down with us, and endeavored by every means in our power to convince them that the man was killed for taking away the musket, and that we would still be friends with them. At sunset they left us seemingly satisfied, and we struck our tent and went on board. Sunday, 16th. This day worked the ship nearer the shore, and moored her in such a manner as to command all the shore of the northeast part of the bay, but more particularly the place where we intended to erect a fort. Punished Richard Hutchins, seaman, with twelve lashes for disobeying commands. Several of the natives came down to the shore of the bay, but not one of them came off to the ship during the whole day. In the evening, I went on shore with only a boat's crew and some of the gentlemen. The natives gathered about us to the number of about 30 or 40 and brought us coconuts, etc., and seemed as friendly as ever. Monday, 17th. At two o'clock this morning, departed this life Mr. Alex Buchan, landskip draftsman to Mr. Banks, a gentleman well skilled in his profession, and one that will be greatly missed in the course of this voyage. He had long been subject to a disorder in his bowels, which had more than once brought him to the very point of death, and was at times subject to fits, of which one of which he was taken on a Saturday morning. This brought on his former disorder, which put a period to his life. Mr. Banks thought it not so advisable to inter the body ashore in a place where we were utter strangers to the custom of the natives on such occasions. He was therefore sent out to sea, and committed to that element with all the decency the circumstance of the place would admit of. This morning, several of the chiefs from the westward made us a visit. They brought with them emblems of peace, which are young plantain trees. These they put on board the ship before they would venture themselves. They brought us a present of two hogs, an article we find here very scarce, and some breadfruit. For these, they had hatchets and other things. In the afternoon, we set up one of the ship's tents ashore, and Mr. Green and myself stayed there the night to observe an eclipse of Jupiter's first satellite, which we was hindered from seeing by the clouds. Tuesday, 18th. Cloudy weather with some showers of rain. This morning took as many people out of the ship as possibly could be spared and set about erecting a fort. Some were employed in throwing up entrenchment, while others was cutting fascines, pickets, etc. The natives were so far from hindering us that several of them assisted in bringing the pickets and fascines out of the woods, and seemed quite unconcerned at what we, we was about. The wood we made use of for this occasion we purchased of them, and we cut no tree down before we had first obtained their consent. By this time, all the ship's sails were unbent, and the armorers forged set up to repair the ironwork, etc. Served fresh pork to the ship's company today for the first time. This is like to be a very scarce article with us, but as to breadfruit, coconuts, and plantains, the natives supply us with as much as we can destroy. Wednesday, 19th. This morning, Lycurgus, whose real name is Tumbura Tumita, came with his family from the westward in order, from what we could understand, to live near us. He brought with him the cover of a house with several other, other materials for building one. We intend to requite the confidence this man seems to put in us by entreating him with all imaginable kindness. Got on shore some empty casks, which we placed in a double row along the bank of the river by way of a breastwork on that side. Thursday, 20th. Wind at southeast and squally with rain. All hands employed on shore, and nothing remarkable except a hog weighing about 90 pound was brought alongside the ship for sale, but those who brought it would not part with it for anything we could offer them but a carpenter's broad axe, and this was what we could not part with. They carried it away. Thus we see those very people who but two years ago preferred a spike nail to an axe of any sort have so far learned the use of them that they will not part with a pig of 10 or 12 pounds weight for anything under a hatchet, and even those of an inferior or small sort are of no great esteem to them. 
in small nails such as 10 penny, 20 penny, or any under 40 penny are of no value at all. But beads, particularly white cut glass beads, are very much valued by them. Mr. Banks and Dr. Solander lays ashore tonight for the first time, their marquees being set up within the walls of the fort and fit for their reception. Friday, 21st. Got the copper oven ashore and fixed it in the bank of the breastwork. Yesterday, as Mr. Green and Dr. Monkhouse were taking a walk, they happened to meet with the body of the man we had shot, as the natives made them fully understand. The manner in which the body was interred being a little extraordinary. I went today with some others to see it. Close by the house wherein he resided when living was built a small shed, but whether for the purpose of, or no, I cannot say, for it was in all respects like some of the sheds or houses they live in. This shed was about 14 or 16 feet long, 10 or 12 broad, and of a proportionable height. One end was wholly open, the other end and two sides was partly enclosed with a kind of wickered work. In this shed lay the corpse, upon a bier or frame of wood with a matted bottom, like a cot frame used at sea, and supported by four posts about five feet from the ground. The body was covered with a mat, and over that a white cloth. Alongside of the body lay a wooden club, one of their weapons of war. The head of the corpse lay next to the close end of the shed, and at this end lay two coconut shells, such as they sometimes use to carry water in. At the other end of the shed was a bunch of green leaves with some dried twigs tied all together and stuck in the ground, and a stone laying by them as big as a coconut. Near to these lay a young plantain tree, such as they use as emblems of peace, and by it lay a stone axe. At the open end of the shed was stuck upright in the ground the stem of a plantain tree about five feet high, on the top of which stood a coconut shell full of fresh water, and on the side of the post hung a small bag, wherein was a few pieces of breadfruit roasted ready for eating. Some of the pieces were fresh and others stale. The natives did not seem to like that we should go near the body, and stood at a little distance themselves while we examined these matters, and appeared to be pleased when we came away. It certainly was no very agreeable place, for it stunk intolerably, and yet it was not above ten yards from the huts wherein several of the living resided. The first day we landed, we saw the skeleton of a human being laying in this manner under the shade that was just big enough to cover it. And some days after that, when some of the gentlemen went with a design to examine it more narrowly, it was gone. It was at this time thought that this manner of interring their dead was not common to all ranks of people, as this was the first we had seen except the skeleton just mentioned. But various were the opinions concerning the provisions, etc. laid out upon the dead. Upon the whole, it should be seen that these people not only believe in a supreme being, but also in a future state. And this must be meant either as an offering to some deity or for the use of the dead in the other world. But this latter is not very probable, as there appeared to be no priestcraft in the thing, for whatever provisions were put there, it appeared very plain to us that there it remained until it consumed away of itself. It is most likely that we shall see more of this before we leave the island. But if it is a religious ceremony, we may not be able to understand it, for the mysteries of most religions are very dark and not easily understood, even by those who profess them. Saturday, 22nd to Thursday, 27th. Nothing worthy of note happened. The people were continually at work upon the fort, and the natives were so far reconciled to us that they rather assisted us than not. This day we mounted six swivels at the fort, which was now nearly finished. This struck the natives with some fear, and some fishermen who lived upon the point moved farther off, and old Oha told us by signs that after four days we should fire great guns from the ship. There were some other circumstances cooperated with this man's prophecy, whether an opinion hath prevailed amongst them that after that time we intended to fire upon them or that they intended to attack us, we know not. The first we do not intend unless the latter takes place, which is highly improbable. Friday 28th. This morning a great number of the natives came to us in their canoes from different parts of the island, several of whom we had not seen before. 
One of these was the woman called by the dolphins the queen of this island. She first went to Mr. Banks' tent at the fort, where she was not known, till the master, happening to go ashore, who knew her, and brought her on board with two men and several women, who seemed to all be of her family. I made them all some presents or another, but to O. Berea, for that is this woman's name, I gave several things, in return for which, as soon as I went on shore with her, she gave me a hog and several bunches of plantains. These she caused to be carried from her canoes up to the fort in a kind of procession, she and I bringing up the rear. This woman is about 40 years of age, and like most of the other women, very masculine. She is head or chief of her own family or tribe, but to all appearance hath no authority over the rest of the inhabitants, whatever she might have when the dolphin was here. Hercules, whose real name is Tutaha, is to all appearance the chief man of the island, and hath generally visited us twice a week since we have been here, and came always attended by a number of canoes and people, and at those times we were sure to have a supply more or less of everything the island afforded, both from himself and from those that came with him, and it is a chance thing that we get a hog at any other time. He was with us at this time, and did not appear very well pleased at the notice that we took of Oberia. Saturday, 29th. This day got the four guns out of the hold, and mounted two of them on the quarterdeck, and the other two in the fort on the bank of the river. Sunday, 30th. This being the day that Oha told us that we should fire our guns, no one of us went from the fort. However, the day passed over without any visible alteration in the behavior of any one of the natives. May 1769 Monday, 1st May This morning, Tutaha came on board the ship and was very desirous of seeing into every chest and drawer that was in the cabin. I satisfied his curiosity so far as to open most of those that belonged to me. He saw several things that he took a fancy to and collected them together, but at last he cast his eyes upon the ads that I had from Mr. Stevens that was made in imitation of one of their stone adzes or axes. The moment he lays his hands upon it, he of his own accord put away everything he had got before and asked me if I would give him that, which I very readily did and he went away without asking for any one thing more, which I by experience knew was a sure sign that he was well pleased with what he had got. This day, one of the natives who appeared to be a chief dined with us, and as he had done some days before. But then there were always some women present, and one or another of them put the victuals into his mouth. But this day there happened to be none to perform that office. When he was helped to victuals and desired to eat, he sat in the chair like a statue, without once attempting to put a mor morsel to his mouth, and would certainly have gone without dinner if one of the servants had not fed him. We have often found the women very officious in feeding us, from which it would seem that it is the custom on some occasions for them to feed the chiefs. However, this is the only instance of that kind we have seen, or that they could not help themselves as well as any of us. This afternoon, we set up the observatory and took the astronomical quadrant ashore for the first time, together with some of other, the other instruments, the fort being now finished and made as tenantable as the time, nature, and the situation of the ground and materials we had to work upon would admit of. The north and south parts consisted of a bank of earth four and a half feet high on the inside and a ditch without, ten feet broad and six feet deep on the west side facing the bay, a bank of earth fourteen high four feet high, and palisades upon that, but no ditch, the works being at water high mark. On the east side, upon the bank of the river, was placed a double row of casks, and as this was the weakest side, the two four-pounders were planted there, and the hole was defended, besides these two guns, with six swivels, and generally about forty-five men with small arms, including the officers and gentlemen who resided ashore. I now thought myself perfectly secure from anything these people would attempt. Tuesday, 2nd. This morning, about 9 o'clock, when Mr. Green and I went to set up the quadrant, it was not to be found. It had never been taken out of the packing case, which was about 18 inches square since it came from Mr. Bird, the maker, 
and the hole was pretty heavy, so that it was a matter of astonishment to us all how it could be taken away. As a sentinel stood at the whole night within five yards of the door of the tent, where it was put, together with several other instruments, but none of them was missing but this. However, it was not long before we got information that one of the natives had taken it away and carried it to the eastward. Immediately, a resolution was taken to detain all the large canoes that were in the bay and to seize upon Tutaha and some others of the principal people and keep them in custody until the quadrant was produced. But this last we did not think proper immediately to put into execution as we had only Oberia in our power and the detaining of her by force would have alarmed all the rest. In the meantime, Mr. Banks, who is always very alert upon all occasions wherein the natives are concerned, and Mr. Green went into the woods to inquire of uh, Tuberotomita, which way and where the quadrant was gone. I very soon was informed that these three was gone to the eastward in quest of it, and some time after I followed myself with a small party of men. But before I went away, I gave orders that if Tutaha came either to the ship or to the fort, he was not to be detained, for I found he had no hand in taking away the quadrant, and that there was almost a certainty of getting it again. I met Mr. Banks and Mr. Greens about four miles from the fort, returning with the quadrant. This was about sunset, and we all got back to the fort about eight o'clock, where I found Tutaha in custody, and a number of the natives crowding about the gate of the fort. My, my, my going into the woods with a party of armed men so alarmed the natives that in the evening they began to move off with their effects, and a double canoe putting off from the bottom of the bay was observed by the ship, and a boat sent after her. In this canoe happened to be Tutaha, and as soon as our boat came up with her, he and all the people that were in the canoe jumped overboard, and he only was taken up and brought on board the ship, together with the canoe. The rest were permitted to swim to the shore. From the ship, Tutaha was sent to the fort, where Mr. Hicks thought proper to detain him until I returned. The scene between Tuburatomita and Tutaha, when the former came into the fort and found the latter in custody, was really moving. They wept over each other for some time. As for Tutaha, he was so far prepossessed with the thought that he was to be killed that he carried he could not be made sensible to the contrary till he was carried out of the fort to the people, many of whom expressed their joy by embracing him, and after all, he would not go away until he had given us two hogs, notwithstanding we did all in our power to hinder him, for it is very certain that the treatment he had met with from us did not merit such a war reward. However, we had it in our power to make him a present of equal value, whenever we pleased. Wednesday 3rd. Very early this morning, Tutaha sent for the canoe we had detained yesterday, and in the afternoon sent a man for an axe and a shirt in return for the hogs he gave us last night. But as this man told us that Tutaha would not come near us himself in less than ten days, we thought proper not to send them, to try if he would not come for them himself for them sooner. <clears throat> 